Hello everyone and welcome back to the Solid State Physics in Nutshell, brought to you by the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. Eric and I have covered quite a bit over the last few weeks, and it'd probably be a good idea to zoom out and do a quick recap. We started way back in the day with the idea that our system has one electron trapped in some sort of box. Back then we assumed nothing about the box except that it had a flat bottom, and that managed to carry us all the way to a decent approximation for properties like conductivity. But since we know the atoms create potential wells inside the box, we created a periodic potential and resolve Schrodinger's equation. Nicole, what did we end up with in this case? Instead of the parabola we got for the free electron model, the dispersion has this funky behavior near the Brillouin zone edge. But of course, we never just have one electron running around in the crystal. So we used an argument about mode spacing in the Brillouin zone to determine how the bands are filled, given a specific number of electrons per unit cell. From that discussion, we boldly defined certain electronic configurations as metals, semiconductors, semimetals, and insulators. This week, we're going to be zooming in on intrinsic semiconductors. Wait, what do you mean by intrinsic? Yeah, so an intrinsic material is a pure material, which is to say that it has no significant number of dopants. In other words, it has properties that are intrinsic to the pure material, instead of arising from some sort of impurity. I'm going to bet that the word significant is a bit trickier than I'd like it to be. So if that's our week's focus, what are we looking at today? Today our goal is to describe how intrinsic semiconductors respond to heat and light. Recall we already know how the density of states for a semiconductor is filled at zero Kelvin with the Fermi energy in the middle of the gap. Nicole, what happens as we start to increase the temperature to some finite T? Well, I know the Fermi-Dirac function will start to smear, meaning the electrons will become thermally excited into the next available state. So for a semiconductor, the electrons will jump into the next band. Seeing this in terms of the density of states, rather than band structure, is probably the simplest approach. So this bubble here is a collection of states that are now empty because the electrons got thermally excited into the conduction band? You got it. Okay, let's pause for a moment for some vocab. We call this bottom band the valence band, and the upper band the conduction band. But don't be misled by names. The carriers in either band contribute to conduction, as we'll see later. And we call the difference between the two energies the band gap. Hmm. Eric, usually a material has one value for the band gap, right? Yeah. But if I look at the spaghetti diagram for silicon as an example, there are a lot of local maxima and minima for the valence and the conduction bands. So which transition is the band gap? That's going to be the lowest energy transition. So for silicon, the band gap is about 1.1 eV and occurs at this point here. If we zoom into the band edges, notice how they don't line up at the same k value? Yeah. And we call that an indirect band gap because it involves transitions between very different k points, as well as energy. For comparison, let's take a look at the spaghetti diagram for gallium arsenide. Where's the band gap for this material? So it looks like it occurs here. Oh, and the edges line up on the same k value. So this is a direct band gap? Yeah, it is. And with this vocab, we now have the tools to see how semiconductors react to light. For this part, we're going to go back to zero Kelvin and just look at optical transitions. The direct band gap is easier to think about, so we're going to start with that one first. Imagine sending in a photon that has some energy, E photon. That photon will only be able to excite electrons from the valence band edge into the conduction band if its energy is equal to the band gap. So sub band gap light just passes through, and light with energy greater than the band gap will likely get absorbed by creating an electronic transition? Yeah, you're thinking about this the right way. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. Hmm, but what about silicon's indirect band gap? Even if the photon has the right energy to bridge the gap, 
we still have to change the momentum of the electron. Okay, slow down. Let's build this up by just considering energy and momentum conservation laws. The direct band gap case is pretty simple, so let's start with that one first. The final energy of the electron is just the energy of the valence band plus the energy of the photon. Similarly, the final momentum of the electron in the conduction band is equal to the momentum in the valence band plus the momentum of the photon. Wait a second. You've been drawing the direct transition as directly over the original K point. So what happened to your momentum conservation? Yeah, that's a good question. What would the momentum of the photon be for, say, green light? 2 pi over about 600 nanometers. And the total width of our Briolin zone is 2 pi over about half a nanometer. So K photon is about 1 thousandths the total width of our Briolin zone, which is to say we effectively have no change in momentum in K space for a direct transition due to the momentum of the photon. That would be a hard shift for me to draw on the board. Okay, but that also suggests that if we look at the conservation laws for the indirect transition, we're in trouble for this two-particle electron-photon excitation. So maybe we need a third particle to satisfy the momentum conservation. Yeah, and for this we're going to use your second favorite boson, Mr. Phonon. Turns out the darn things are pretty useful in the sense that we can create or destroy them at will. So for an electron to make this gap, do you think a phonon is going to be created or destroyed? Well, I think it could be either depending on the momentum of the phonon. If we use up a phonon going in the direction of the induced momentum, then that's destruction. Yeah, and the phonon and its associated momentum get eaten up by the electron that is getting excited. On the other hand, we could create a phonon going in the opposite direction, and that still satisfies this momentum equation. Good, now let's take a look at energy conservation. This time, we have one equation for phonon creation and another for destruction. In the case of destruction, the electron gets to eat up the phonon's delicious energy in addition to the photons. But for phonon creation, we subtract the phonon energy rather than adding it. Yeah, it takes energy to make this phonon. In either case, we're dealing with a three-particle process, which has a very low probability of occurring. This conservation math is all well and good, but how would we be able to tell experimentally what kind of band gap a material has? Well, what do you think? Just shine some light on it, see what it absorbs? Love it. Through the delightfully named Beer's Law, we can go from absorbance to an absorption coefficient as a function of the energy of the incoming light. Let's start with a plot of the absorption coefficient versus energy for a direct band gap material. Where this sharp edge is where the band gap begins, because any photon with an energy below this won't be able to excite electrons from the valence band edge into the conduction band. Yeah, and another question for you. Why do you think the absorption coefficient is low right at the band, but it gets higher as you increase the energy? Um... Let me say it differently. How many modes are available for an electron at the conduction band edge? Only a few. So then as energy increases, more of the above states are available for the electrons to jump into and more of the electrons in the valence band are able to jump up into the conduction band. Exactly. Now the story for the absorption coefficient for an indirect gap material is a little more complicated. At sufficiently high energies, we can excite electrons across the higher energy gap, and we see direct behavior like so. But remember, we had an indirect transition. Right. So between the band gap energy and this direct transition energy, we should have a much lower absorption coefficient because the three particle processes we described earlier have a low probability of occurring. Yeah, as a quick example, let's look at silicon and gallium arsenide, which are used in the solar cell industry as absorber materials. When building a solar cell, you better bet it's important to be able to absorb visible wavelengths really, really well. But if silicon has an indirect band gap, and we know it has a really low absorption coefficient, how can it be an effective solar absorber? So it turns out materials with an indirect band gap need to be extremely thick because of their low absorption coefficient, on the order of a few hundred microns. Direct gap materials, on the other hand, only need to be a few microns thick. Sounds like silicon isn't really a perfect PV material, since you would need it to be really thick. Yeah, it's really a tragedy that it doesn't have a direct transition. If it did, high efficiency solar cells would be significantly cheaper. But we'll talk about this in greater detail in a few weeks. So it looks like it's a good time for a recap. 
Today we looked at how electrons can be thermally excited into the conduction band through either heat or exposure to photons with a specific energy. We also defined the band gap as the smallest difference in energy between the conduction band edge and the valence band edge. This gap defines the cutoff energy for optically induced transitions. We discussed why optical transitions across a direct band gap exhibit virtually no change in the electron's momentum and we get a rapidly rising absorption coefficient. And the indirect band gap transition involves a three particle process between a photon, electron, and phonon that leads to a small rising absorption coefficient. However, the absorption coefficient rises rapidly for optical transitions that are direct in nature. So as always, we have a couple questions for you to consider at home. So far we've been invoking there is always an empty state in the conduction band for the valence electron to get excited into. Instead, say we have an intrinsic semiconductor and start hitting it with really intense light. What will happen to the observed optical gap as you increase the intensity of the light? Ooh, like a shoulder-mounted laser? That's how I like to do my science. Of course you do. Okay, so here's a second one. We labeled this upper band as the conduction band. What do you think will happen with electrons that are excited up into this upper band in the presence of an applied electric field? But wait, there's also these empty states that the electrons leave behind. Will this band do anything interesting in an electric field? So let's go back to this thermal excitation business. Consider a semiconductor with a band gap of 1 eV. Can you plot this thermal smearing of electrons across the gap for three different temperatures, say up to 2,000 degrees Celsius? So you're talking about what fraction of the density of states is occupied? Well, not only that, but how deep into the conduction band are the electrons excited? Are we talking one millielectron volt or one electron volt? An animation would look even cooler. So that about does it for our discussion today. Next time we're going to look at how intrinsic semiconductors react in the presence of an external electric field. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.